go ahead and get started. I just realized my name's not on there today. <laughs> Thank you all for coming today. Um, I'm going to try to make this the best PE seminar you've heard so far this semester. <laughs> so, uh, obviously, this is the first one. There will be a number of more, of more, more seminars, so I'll just get the seminar series kicked off for this semester. Um, today, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the research that I've been doing here at U of L, and um, actually, some of this was um, work that started before I came here and has continued here. So I'm going to talk about that. Um, there are several different research projects that we're working on, uh, but they all kind of have some aspect of relating to each other through the use of ultrasound technology. Um, I started out actually as an uh, undergraduate uh, in electrical and computer engineering at Ohio State, and then PhD in U University of Cincinnati in biomedical engineering. Initially, I was doing research on MRI, uh, MRI imaging, and then kind of moved more into ultrasound. Um, I like the portability aspect of ultrasound, the fact that not, you don't only need a $1 million system that's stationary, but you can carry it around and you can use it for so many different things. MRI is very useful, and I really like working with that, but ultrasound has a lot of, uh, a lot of other potential. So I've really found myself moving, focusing more in that direction, although I still have some research that, that kind of expands there. Um, I did postdocs in Boston, Boston University, Harvard Medical School, and University of Pittsburgh. Uh, again, working with ultrasound. And then I came here um, to start my own research program here. So the title of this talk is Harnessing the Power of Ultrasound for New Medical Treatments. Um, ultrasound is obviously widely used for imaging, but um, there's a lot of interest now in using it for therapeutic applications. So I'm going to focus on two particular applications that I'm focused on, or that I'm working on here. Um, there are other applications that we're interested in, but these are two that we've really been focused on. Um, I'm going to make this talk more kind of bio-focused or bioengineering focused. It's bioengineering. But uh, we do a lot of work with ultrasound that also involves physics and other aspects of engineering, acoustics and that kind of thing. So just to give you a little background about how our projects came to be, I'm, I'm going to take a step back, way back actually, a few hundred years and talk about the discovery of cell nuclei and kind of walk towards where we are now from there. Um, I don't know if any of you know the story of who discovered the first nuclei. Um, there was this guy, Dutch scientist, back in the 1600s. He actually um, worked on fabrics and he had a microscope. Microscopes had been invented uh, around that time and he had one. It wasn't too powerful, but he had one. And he was using it to look at fabrics to um, I don't know exactly what they did, but you know, to, to see at high resolution what was going on in, with the fabrics and I guess the quality and that kind of thing. So he was doing this for his you know, regular work and then he wanted better microscopes. He came up with a way to increase the power of his microscope and really uh, uh, much better than the existing microscopes at the time. And then he got curious, what else can I look at? Just, I guess he got tired of looking at fabrics under the microscope all the time and he said, what else can I look at? So I, you know, he's Dutch, he's by the ocean, a lot of fish. He grabbed some fish, took out some fish blood, and threw them under the microscope. And he saw something interesting. He, he knew that the blood would have blood cells. So he put the blood under the microscope, looked at the cells, and he saw something inside those cells. And he wrote about it and he said, there's, there's something round inside the cell. The, the cell membrane is round, you know, you have your cell there, but then inside of that, there's another vesicle and he had no idea what it was, uh, but he wrote about it. If he had any idea, it probably would have blown his mind what's actually going on in the nucleus. This looked like a little circle in there. But that was the first description of the cell nucleus. So he didn't know about DNA, he just knew that the nucleus was there. And then later on, in 1869, another scientist, Swiss scientist named Friedrich Meischer, uh, was working with cells. And he precipitated the cells, he lysed them, and he saw, actually specifically the nuclei, took the nucleus, um, and he noticed that something was coming out of the nucleus. Something was oozing out when he would lyse them. And this kind of, he wrote about it, he says, something gooey, this kind of gooey thing leaking out. And uh, he, he wrote about it, he didn't know what it was. You know what it was? It's the chromosome, right? The DNA. And again, he had no clue how important this was. He just thought, oh, there's just some gooey stuff coming out of the nucleus. 
Uh, if he had known that that was, that was the DNA that programmed every cell in the whole body, I mean, he probably wouldn't even believe it. It's, it kind of makes you wonder, what is it that we, you know, just kind of take for granted or ignore today that's actually really significant. But it's, it's fascinating. So that, that's kind of where the first description of DNA was uh, described. Didn't really know how it worked or anything. Of course, later on, you're probably more familiar with the story of Rosalind Franklin. In 1952, she took the first, uh, basically the first X-ray diffraction image of DNA of the chromosomes there. Um, and that's, that's a, obviously a famous image that um, really helped scientists understand the structure of DNA in the nucleus. Um, unfortunately, she didn't get the credit for it. The credit went to Watson and Crick because um, they were the ones that wrote the paper. Um, there's a story that they actually snuck into their lab and got, got a copy of the uh, picture without her knowledge. Um, but she was the one that, that was able to get that picture. And so working together, they were able to, or maybe that's not the way to put it, but uh, combined, they were able to describe the structure of DNA. And, and since then, we've understood that DNA co encodes for proteins, right? All the proteins in our body are encoded by DNA. There's certain sequences in our DNA that encode for proteins. So in the eight, 1980s, uh, the sci some of the scientists in this community said, Okay, we know that the DNA encodes for proteins. What if we can sequence every base pair in our genome and then go back and look and see, okay, you know, these are the, the sequences that encode for proteins. We'll understand everything about our body, about disease. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll completely understand what's going on in our cells if we can just encode the entire genome. But it was very daunting, about four billion base pairs in your, in your genome. And at the time, just mapping out one base pair was a challenge. And the idea of doing four billion was, you know, like trying to go to Mars or something. They really daunting. Uh, but they decided to do this. I think Congress, um, uh, well, uh, gave some money into, the, into this project. And, and the Human, Human Genome Project launched in 1990. Uh, originally, um, it was Watson or Crick started. I forget which one. Watson, I think, was the one that started. But it, Francis Collins was the one that really was the director of the project, and um, through most of this project up until when it was completed around 2003, he's currently the director of NIH. But he's also well known because in the 80s he discovered the BRCA gene that um, increases the risk of breast cancer in his lab, and then he became the director of this project. So they go out on this project, and they go through, and, and they actually had some really big breakthroughs in technology throughout this project to be able to do it, and they accomplished the goal. They sequenced the entire human genome. It took a while, although now they do this all regularly. They can do this much easier. It was $3 billion to do the first human genome to sequence it. Now you can do it under $1,000. But, uh, so they go through this and they found you know, all the sequences. They start looking through the, sequ uh, the sequences, and they're expecting, okay, there's this protein, this protein, this protein, this protein, we'll understand it all. And they were shocked that only 2% of the genome that they sequenced actually encoded for proteins. Uh, this was really surprising. So 98% of the genome didn't encode for any proteins, and they basically said, this must be junk. You know, we have 98% of our genes are just junk, they're not doing anything. They're clearly not encoding for proteins, so what else could they be doing? Um, so that was a surprise, but we said, well, you know, 2% of the gene is encoding all the proteins. I guess that's good enough. I guess the other 98% isn't really important. Around the same time, actually, while this was going on, there were a couple guys studying worms. Exciting, isn't it? I don't know. I mean, I, I, obviously, there's a lot of value in studying worms for certain research, but it, it may not sound like the most uh, earth-shattering or world-changing research. But these guys are studying worms, and they actually had a huge discovery. Um, in 1993, they found some little pieces of RNA floating around in the worm. They said, this is kind of strange. There's all this, these pieces of RNA floating around. At first, you know, you think, okay, well, it's just byproducts of RNA. It wasn't messenger RNA. You have your messenger RNA. These are little pieces, little segments, about 20 base pairs. And at first, I thought it could probably just some leftover RNA. From, you know, the RNA's been cleaved, and then we've got little pieces floating around. But then they found that uh, it actually seemed these sequences were very specific um, in terms of what was produced. And they also seemed to have some sort of a function. Um, so that, that, that really uh, started or formed the 
discovery of microRNAs, which we now understand a little bit more about. And these microRNAs are actually really fascinating, but really important, but um, before this, people didn't even know they existed. So they found that, okay, there's these RNAs, these little pieces of RNA floating around the cell. They're not encoding proteins, but they seem to be important. So what do they do? And since then, we've learned more about this. It turns out over 50% of the entire genome is transcribed into RNA, even though they don't encode for, pro most of it doesn't encode for proteins. So you have 2% encoding for proteins. You have all this other part of the genome still, still getting converted to RNA. And then you might think, okay, well, it's just RNA. It's not encoding for protein. It's just kind of floating around the cell. Well, it turns out that they actually, many of these regulate protein expression indirectly. So they don't code for proteins, but they regulate the expression. So we call these non-coding RNAs, and this is a huge area of research right now. MicroRNAs are one subset of non-coding RNAs. They're now, they're now finding there are very long sequences of non-coding RNAs that are also important. They call them long non-coding RNAs. They're like RNAs. Um, and they found that a lot of these non-coding RNAs will actually bind to the messenger RNAs and block translation into protein. Uh, and they'll bind to, especially the microRNAs will bind to certain sequences of messenger RNAs. Not all of them, but, but more than one usually, not just one protein. So they may regulate, in some cases, hundreds of proteins are getting regulated by one microRNA sequence. And the cells are actually producing these microRNAs um, to regulate the protein expression. What happens when those microRNA levels get out of whack? It can actually play a role in disease, cancer and cardiac diseases and things like that. So there's a big area of research right now on these microRNAs. And as I said, they directly affect protein expression. They can either degrade the messenger RNA or block translation. So uh, I do a lot of research in cardiology and in cardi uh, in cardiology, they found a number of microRNAs that, block, that uh, when they're dysregulated, they are, play a role in cardiac dysfunction. So most of them are numbered. So we have all these microRNAs with these different numbers here. And you can see all the different roles that they play. Some of them affect cell survival, fibrosis, angiogenesis, um, you know, and other, other factors as well, hypertrophy. And when the heart gets stressed, there's some you know, cardiac disease or myocardial infarction or something like that, then these levels of these microRNAs change quite a bit. What's really interesting is they found that if these microRNAs get dysregulated, if you do a therapeutic in intervention that makes these microRNAs go back to their normal levels, you actually get improved outcomes. So it's really fascinating. I mean, these aren't even encoding for proteins, but because they regulate those proteins indirectly, if you can therapeutically adjust the levels of these microRNAs, you can actually get a uh, therapeutic effect. So the way to do this, there's um, the primary ways that this has been done is by creating either microRNA mimics or microRNA inhibitors, depending on which one. Some of them go up too high and some of them go down too low. So if the microRNA levels decrease and you want to restore those levels, then you can use a mimic that's basically a similar structure to the endogenous microRNA and replace that. If their levels are going up too high, then you can use inhibitors. In my lab, we work with both. Today, I'm going to focus only on the inhibitors, uh, but we have uh, ongoing research where we're doing both, depending on which type of microRNA we're trying to target. The first microRNA inhibitor is actually already in clinical trials. It's in phase two clinical trials. It's, it seems to be working pretty well, but there's a problem. Um, when you inject these microRNA inhibitors, they go everywhere, and they may you know, some of these may have a beneficial effect in the heart, but maybe not in other organs. Those clinical trials are in the liver because most of the microRNA inhibitors naturally go to the liver. So they said, well, they're going to the liver, let's pick a disease in the liver and focus on that, and, and it's working okay for that. But delivering these microRNA inhibitors to the heart is more difficult. So how can we do this? And um, there are several barriers we have to overcome. First of all, when you inject these, uh, these are nucleic acids, these inhibitors, um, and when you inject these in the bloodstream, they can get degraded by nucleases. So you have to, to get them to survive the nuclease degradation, which sometimes you can do by uh, chemi chemi uh, chemical modifications. But then they have to leak out of the endothelial barrier at the right location, in the heart, obviously, and you know, maybe the coronary arteries or something like that. And then once you get out of there, you still, got, you still have to get across the cell membrane. This might be a cardiomyocyte. And usually the way this happens is through endocytosis, so they get taken up in these endosomes, but that's that's still not good enough. They're inside the cell, but they're inside a vesicle, so you gotta get outside of that vesicle and get it in the cytoplasm. So there are all these barriers that we have to overcome. 
there have been some strategies to overcome these. Viral delivery is used a lot, um, works in some cases, but it also has concerns about immunogenicity. Chemically modified nucleic acids can resist degradation. You can also use engineered drug and gene carriers like nanoparticles, glyphosate. A lot of potential with these, but ideally we'd have a way to control the spatial and temporal uh, delivery. So you control where it's delivered and when, um, and ideally from an external uh, control, so that we can localize the treatment and reduce off-target effects. So if we can target these microRNA inhibitors just to the heart and uh, deliver them there so they don't go everywhere, um, that would be better. So our <coughs> approach to do this is using ultrasound. And specifically, we have a term called ultrasound targeted microbubble destruction, where we use microbubbles in combination with ultrasound. We actually put our, in some cases, put our therapeutic agent on the microbubbles, and then the, bite, the bubbles will carry the, uh, the therapeutics to the target site, and then we can focus the ultrasound just on the heart or just on another location. You've probably heard of ultrasound before, probably seen it before, maybe used it before. Um, it's widely used for diagnostic applications, and when you think of ultrasounds, most of you probably think about imaging. Um, it's been around for a while, and uh, you know, used for many different diagnostic applications, including fetal ultrasound. I don't know if you see the resemblance, but that's uh, one of my kids there. Um, <coughs> a while ago, he's now uh, born and much bigger now, but very useful you know, for that type of imaging. There's also strong potential for therapeutic applications. Uh, ultrasound is actually already used and FDA approved for certain ther uh, therapeutic applications, especially for cancer treatment. Um, people aren't usually as familiar with that but uh, there's, there's a lot of work going into that. There are some benefits for using ultrasound. So uh, compared to other imaging, MRI, CT, PET, ultrasound's lower cost, it's not invasive, it's not ionizing, it's no radiation like you do with uh, X-ray or CT, has gr uh, great temporal resolution. So you have, compared to those other modalities, you have much faster frame rates usually. It can also be used for anatomical and or physiologic imaging, uh, and it's capable for simultaneous imaging therapy. That's what I like about it. I can image what I'm doing and also deliver a therapy at the same time. So it's there in Austin. I know we have a lot of people here that also work with MRI and CT. The resolution, the spatial resolution of those imaging modalities is way better, as you know, at least right now. So there's a benefit for all of these. It just depends on the application. Um, and as I said, I used to work some with MRI, and I definitely appreciate the benefits there. So it depends what you're trying to do, but for therapeutic delivery, I found that ultrasound has its benefits. Um, you, know, you, you do have a lower spatial resolution, so there's a trade-off there. But, um, this is actually, let's see this will play, I forgot what this is. a video I took. This, this shows you, so you know, we think of ultrasound as just basically imaging, um, but you can actually, if you have focused ultrasound, you, you can drive it high enough pressure, it can actually create some interesting effects. This was something I did in the lab uh, in Boston, um, put a focus ultrasound, very high power, in a water tank, turn it on, and watch what happens when I turn it on. It's focused right at the water surface, it actually creates a fountain. It's just the ultrasound itself, just forming, forming the fountain there. It was very high pressure. We were actually using that pressure to melt tumors uh, in, in rabbits, just to melt those away. But anyway, it's, it's an illustration. So when they do ultrasound imaging clinically, they, they use lower pressures to make sure it's safe, and it is. We have lots and lots of evidence that's safe to use clinically, but those machines are carefully regulated to make sure that that's the case. Um, if you increase your ultrasound pressure high enough, it can be uh, damaging. The other aspect of my research I mentioned is the microbubbles. Um, you may not know this, microbubbles are actually already FDA approved. They're used clinically quite a bit. They inject them in patients, and they um, use these bubbles to image blood flow on ultrasound images in the heart. So that's the only currently approved use uh, for microbubbles, but they're actually used quite a bit in echocardiography, and it really helps you see the blood flow through the valves into the heart um, much more clearly on an ultrasound image. But they're also used for, uh, well, they're also in development for drug and gene delivery. So they're small, they're usually less than three microns, so they fit in the capillaries. Um, <coughs> we use a non-toxic gas, it's inert, uh, perfluorocarbon, it's low solubility, so it's very stable. And then we have some sort of a shell, usually phospholipid, you can also use proteins or polymer. Um, if we use cationic shell, we can actually load the nucleic acids on through charge charge interaction, which is what we do with our microRNA inhibitors. When we apply an ultrasound field to these bubbles, it actually induces <laughs> oscillation. So these bubbles will oscillate in the ultrasound field. You have positive and negative pressures that the bubble experiences and it compresses and expands. 
this is actually a video um, that was taken of a bubble oscillating in when I was in Pittsburgh. Um, there's only a couple systems that are capable of doing this, and only one in this country, which is in Pittsburgh. But um, these bubbles oscillate very rapidly. We're usually driving them in the megahertz range. So um, this was acquired at 10 million frames per second. I slowed it down a little bit so we could see what's going on because I can't really resolve that frame rate very well. So slowed down. Here's what's going on. You can see the bubble oscillating in the ultrasound field as it grows and shrinks. At higher pressures, we can actually burst the bubble. It actually, uh, we can make it grow large and then collapse through um, the inertia or basically through the momentum of, of its uh, movement. So you can see this bubble's growing. It's collapsing. It's actually recoalescing here, but the bubbles are collapsing. And when that happens, when they collapse, it causes an <coughs> interesting phenomenon that's actually useful for therapeutic applications, but also um, has some other effects. So, uh, when that bubble collapses, the temperature very briefly on a very small scale can actually exceed the surface of the sun. Uh, it may sound scary, it's, it's not, you wouldn't measure it directly, but it's pretty uh, amazing what's going on at that small scale. Um, you, it also can generate light. I've actually seen it before. Um, you have to have a very dark room and just the right experimental design. Uh, it's a very faint light. But it does actually generate photons um, in some cases, depending on how the experiment's set up, and I've actually seen the, the bubbles kind of blinking, basically, it's getting light, it's pretty cool. They call that, um, uh, so I'm actually blanking on the name here, but, so there's a lot of factors going on as far as uh, when these bubbles collapse, um, the sonoluminescence is what that would be called, that's right, so uh, when it's emitting the light, it's a sonoluminescence. This effect also, when these bubbles collapse, this actually causes damage to ship propellers. As the propellers are spinning, they're actually um, creating these bubbles that collapse. On, and it can, over years, it can erode away the metal. And it's also used in nature. These um, pistol shrimp actually use this to capture their prey. So they snap their claws, it creates a bubble that collapses, and that creates a shock wave. When they do that, if they aim the shock wave to a nearby uh, animal or prey, um, it will stun the prey and then they can go out and grab it. I guess they're a little slow, but this is, this is their technique. There's a shock wave that they do. So they use this in nature. We use this for therapeutic delivery. So this is a confocal microscopy image. Um, a colleague of mine took this one. I didn't take this, but it's a great, it's a great video. So you'll see this cell here. We're going to zoom in right here. You're going to see the bubble there, and then we're going to burst the bubble with ultrasound. So Right there's the bubble. We burst it, and there's a hole in the cell membrane. Um, and so that's that's how we can basically uh, induce. We, we call it sun operation because we're porating the hole. You see, within about less than a minute, that, that hole reseals. But while that hole is open, we have an opportunity to deliver therapeutics more directly into the cell. Um, and you might say, okay, is this bad for the cell? It can be. We have too many holes, and they're too large. But we found that if we have the right size and the right number of holes, um, they, they recover pretty well, just like in this video. So there's a therapeutic window like there would be for a drug. Um, here's another video. Um, we actually had a red dye on the outside of the cell that uh, for my dye, so you don't see it until it gets into the cell. Um, and what we do here, this is another confocal microscopy video. There's the bubbles right there. If you see the dye go in, you can see this is actually the cell retracted a little bit from it, the neighboring cell, and then it goes back. And you can see all the dye in there in, in the cell. Um, so this is how we try to do our therapeutic delivery, and there's some advantages to this. First of all, the bubbles actually help protect against nucleus degradation, so we don't have to um, worry so much about the nucleases degrading the nucleic acids. When we burst the bubble, it permeabilizes the endothelial layer at that location, or can it, uh, uh, under certain conditions. So we can get more local delivery there, and it can also permeabilize the cell membrane as you saw, so we can skip endocytosis. So this is how we're trying to do this. We're using ultrasound and microbubbles to target delivery to a specific location. And one of the projects that we were interested in was targeting cardiac therapy. We found there's this microRNA called MIR23A that plays a big role in cardiac hypertrophy and um, can basically make cardiac hypertrophy progress towards heart failure when these levels are too high, or at least it plays a role in that. So we were interested in targeting that. Um, we knew that from previous studies that others have done, it's up, uh, this microRNA is upregulated in cardiac dysfunction and in, um, hypertrophy. And 
it's been reported that if you knock down this microRNA, it improves cardiac function. But the problem was, so far, they've just had to use systemic delivery. They've used really high doses. It goes everywhere. We said, maybe we can do this with ultrasound and microbubbles and deliver this, this inhibitor specifically to the heart and get these types of effects. So that was our goal for this project. Um, and this was work that started in Pittsburgh and is continuing here. And the idea is we can deliver this microRNA inhibitor specifically to the heart and reduce systemic uh, toxicity. So to do that, we made microbubbles. We loaded them with the, the um, microRNA's inhibitor. This is a sequence of the inhibitor schematic there bubble with the DNA on the side. You can see the size there, mostly less than four microns um, based on this, this plot here. So, so most of the bubbles are less than four microns. Average size is two microns. We initially, we did some testing in vitro. This was the setup that we used. So we grew cardiomyocytes, actually neonatal rat cardiomyocytes uh, in our petri dish. We added the bubbles that had the DNA and then we flipped the dish over because the bubbles float. So we flipped it over so the bubbles would float up to the top. We had to seal the dish. We placed our ultrasound transducer underneath and applied the ultrasound, we actually scanned it back and forth. Um, we used a clinical system for this. Um, so we tried, tried this experiment to see what happened, and what we found was that when we did this treatment, we got significant reduction in the mirror levels when we delivered this inhibitor. So it seemed to work pretty well. The blue bars there is basically an identical treatment, but the sequence we used is a, a negative control at NC for negative control. So the sequence doesn't do anything to the microRNAs. But the red bars, that's an inhibitor of MIR-23A. It's a complementary sequence that binds to it, degrades it. And so when we went in at different time points, 6 hours, 24, 48, or different doses, we saw that these levels were significantly reduced um, when we did the ultrasound uh, treatment. But ultimately, we were wondering whether this had a functional effect. So we looked at the cardiomyocyte size, because this MIR-23A, when those levels go up, the cardiomyocytes get larger, you get hypertrophy and the dysfunction. It may be hard to see on here, um, but this was with the negative control before the phenylephrine is the agonist that induces hypertrophy in this model. And, and this, these are the same cells, and they get larger. Like, if you look at this one here, that one's this one here. So they're getting larger um, after this, this hypertrophy stimulus is applied. But when we did our treatment with our inhibitor, they didn't change too much, maybe a little bit, but not as much. Um, that's just representative microscopy images, but when we measured it, we also saw that that was the case. But we were more interested in what's going on in vivo. So we set up an experiment in mice where we uh, implanted these <coughs> osmotic mini pumps, which induced the cardiac dysfunction. <coughs> so that's a day zero, and then we start the treatments. So we're doing the ultrasound treatments, we're also doing echo to measure the cardiac function. And we went up to two weeks. And again, we're using a clinical ultrasound system. For this one, we used a dose that was 40 times lower than the, what was used systemically. Because we're putting on the, on the micro bubbles, we expect local delivery, you don't need as high of a dose. This is what it looks like when you actually inject the bubbles in the mice. Um, you'll actually see, this is the contrast from the bubbles here. This is the heart, that's the left ventricle. We have the atria up here, aorta is here, right atrium, left atrium. It's a little hard to see, but you can, what you can see is we're bursting the bubbles. So see how it goes dark real briefly there? That's when the bubbles are getting burst by um, our therapeutic ultrasound. This is, we have two, two ultrasound systems going on, one's for imaging and one's for therapy. So we're bu bursting the bubbles in, in the heart and, and we know that's when we expect the delivery to happen. So we can actually use ultrasound to confirm that the bubbles are there, that they're bursting. We see the image go dark when they burst. So it's uh, useful for that. When we do that, then two weeks later, we did echocardiography. So this is without bubbles, this is just taking uh, ultrasound images of the heart to, to um, measure the cardiac function. And maybe a little hard to see, but this is the negative control group. Um, the heart's just not really contracting too well. I don't know if you can tell, it's not contracting all the way. It's just a, a kind of, not, the function just isn't as good there. Um, you can see the walls contracting a little bit, but not all the way here. Again, it's hard to see, um, and there's actually a rib artifact there, but it's contracting much more strongly, almost all the way. Almost normal in that case. Um, and so, so that, this is just one representative example, but that's, that's kind of what we uh, were seeing in the study. And when we had a cardiologist who knows how to read these images, I tried my best, but I'm not trained in cardiology. So we had a cardiologist read this. She was blinded. She didn't know which animals were which. She just gave them the images and analyzed them, and this is what she saw. So uh, when we did this, the blue bars here, this is the animals that had the uh, hypertrophy stimulus, the phenylephrine, 
Um, you see their, their fractional shortening, their ejection fraction decreased at two weeks compared to baseline. So they, you know, they're basically diseased at this point. Uh, the, the green ones are just healthy mice, didn't do anything to them. The red ones had the hypertrophy stimulus, but they also had the ultrasound delivery with this inhibitor, and we saw almost the same function. It was really exciting. So this was, uh, this was really neat that it seemed to be working well there. Um, this actually just got accepted in uh, their Gnostics journal, and it's going to be published in the next week or two, I think. Um, and based on this, we actually got a grant from the American Heart Association to expand this to other microRNAs, and that's currently ongoing. Um, and we'll be presenting that work at the, the newest results um, at the American Heart Association in the fall. Uh, oh yeah, one other point about this in vivo study, we also looked at the microRNA levels and we saw there was a significant reduction in the microRNA levels in the heart as well. Um, not completely to baseline, but uh, lower than the negative control. And then when we looked at the, the cell size, also saw some reduction there. Uh, so there seems to be uh, some effects at that level, which makes sense, you know, since we saw the improved function. So that work is ongoing. Um, there's one other pro uh, project I'm, I'm going to talk about in the second part of this talk. Um, that's kind of a newer thing we've been working on. Some of you have probably heard about it. I think it's a little unusual, but it's, uh, it's an interesting project. So before I do that, what's What's the most common procedure in U.S. hospitals? Um, there are a few that probably come to mind. Um, certainly catheterizations are very common. But if you look statistically, uh, usually they report that the most common procedure it, are blood transfusions in, in hospitals. Over two million people in the U.S. get blood transfusions every year. The total number of units that are transfused are in the tens of millions, uh, usually around 13 million or so. And in many cases, it's a life-saving procedure. I mean, you, you have to have oxygen delivered to your tissues, or your tissues are going to die, your organs are going to die because of the oxygen. What carries the oxygen to your tissues? Hemoglobin, right? Red blood cells. Only one way you're going to get oxygen to the tissues, and that's, that's with blood. So if you don't have blood, it's a problem. Not to mention, you know, coagulation and all the other factors that are important. So I didn't originally start out doing blood transfusions, but, or, or research on this. Um, but you'll see we actually ended up starting a project on this. Uh, and that's because there's a really big problem. It's the most common procedure in U.S. hospitals. 12 million, over 12 million units of blood is transfused each year. You know, millions of people around the world, over 80 million units. And, and you have 2 million people in the U.S., millions of people elsewhere that are basically, uh, depending on this, it's life or death. Some of these people are very young, too. So if you, know, if you can't give them a blood transfusion, there are kids that are dying that, that could live many more years if they had one. The problem is it only lasts for six weeks. Um, you know, many of you probably donate blood, um, and you keep getting asked to come back. And that's because, uh, well, obviously it's being used, but also when you donate it six weeks later, it's, it's no good. So the FDA doesn't allow them to use it after 42 days. Um, it has to be refrigerated. There is a procedure where they can freeze it for up to 10 years at negative 80 degrees. Uh, there are a lot of issues with that procedure, so it's for rarely used. Um, so right now, the way it works basically is we just have to keep getting donations and maintain that supply every six weeks uh, for for blood transfusions. What would be nice is if we had a way that we could store blood for a longer period of time, and then uh, obviously that would solve a lot of the problems that we have right now. If you live in a city like Louisville, it's not. Uh, you're, you're usually okay. A lot of people, a lot of college students, high school students, you know, a lot of people donating, not just that age, but you know, a lot of people donating blood. Um, if we run low on blood, there are other cities with blood that'll bring it, ship it here quickly. We have a good airport and good highways. But there are parts of the country where that's not the case, where um, they have very limited blood, uh, blood supply, and obviously parts of the world especially. So how might we be solve this problem? Well, I always like to, um, learn things from nature. We talked about that a little bit earlier with, with some of the other examples, but we, we looked at, into this as well here. Um, and there are a lot of examples where you can learn something from nature. You think of the Wright brothers designing the airplane with this study to develop the wings on their planes. They studied how birds fly, the, the shapes of the wings uh, for birds. And they learned a lot from birds that they applied in their design of airplanes. I don't know if any of you know about this. A few of you probably do because I probably talked about it when I uh, taught your class. but um, Alessandro Volta was a scientist, uh, well, maybe a couple hundred years ago, 
And he designed the battery based on the electric organ and torpedo fish. So back at that time, scientists said they knew electricity existed. They knew about lightning and everything. They could generate it even, but they couldn't store it. They said there's no way you could store electricity. You just have to, once you generate it, you just use it right away. There's a lot of debate about this. But he thought, well, some people thought you could do it, but there was debate about this. He said, you know, there's this fish, this torpedo fish, and it can generate electric current to stun its food, you know, to get catch the food, stun its prey. How does it do that? It must have a way that it can store up the electricity and then disperse it when it's ready to catch its prey. So he took one and opened it up, and he found this organ called the electric organ in there. And he saw that it has all these little stacks of disks inside that organ. And he looked into it, and they're basically, some, basically like electrodes, stack of electrodes. But uh, he said, well, well, I can make something like that. So he did. He made, they call it the voltaic pile. And if you look at this um, design that he came up with, it's very similar to the electric organ of a torpedo fish. And if you take a, a um, alkaline battery, you know, AA, AAA, or C, or whatever, if you open it up, which I highly recommend not doing, but if you do, if you open it up, it'll look just like, more or less, like, just like the original design. Um, it's full of acid to help conduct the electricity. So, and you've probably seen the acid leak out before, so you probably don't want to open it up. But if you're careful, it's okay. Um, but it's fascinating, you know, you know, even now, of course, now we have the rechargeables and lithium ion and all that, but the original battery design was really based off of the electric organ of, of the uh, torpedo fish. That's kind of a side, um, I'm not researching torpedo fish or batteries yet, but um, I just think it's, it's me fascinating, so you get that bonus. Um, but along these lines, so, you know, the Wright brothers learned from nature designing airplanes. Volta learned from nature in designing a battery. Could we learn something from nature that could help us preserve red blood cells in a long, uh, for a long time? And, and a good way to do that would be to dry them out as a powder. We do that with, you know, vaccines and other therapeutics, pharmaceuticals, sometimes to dry it out as a powder, lyophilize it. Could we do that with red blood cells? If we could, it, you know, lasts a lot longer. And the idea, again, for doing this is based on uh, what we've learned in nature. So there are actually organisms that can survive for years, decades, in some cases centuries, as a dried powder. Um, one of the more famous ones are water bears or tardigrades. Some of you may have heard of tardigrades. This is a tardigrade here. Very, very common. They're all over the place, virtually indestructible. Uh, other than that, not too interesting. Not do a whole lot, they're very small. But um, they can withstand High temperatures, low temp extreme high temperatures, low temperatures, they can withstand um, high doses of radiation. They're really hard to, to uh, <laughs> they're very hardy. Um, but one of the things that's really interesting about them is they can dry out completely and uh, basically become this. This is a water bear that's just completely dried out. They can stay like this for years and years, completely dried out. And then you have water, you know, maybe they're in the desert, has a rain for a couple of years, and then it starts raining again. They come back to life and they start walking around, swimming around, they have babies, back to normal. You wouldn't even know. It's crazy, right? It's like science fiction, but it's actually true. So they do that. The other one that, that uh, and there are many ant organisms that do this, but another one that does this are the brine shrimp or sea monkeys. Have you ever heard of sea monkeys or played with them before? Um, you can buy them, you know, there's this little kids thing, you can get sea monkeys, you have water, they come to life, they're swimming around. So how do they do this? Um, one of the main ways they do, especially these sea monkeys, they use a sugar called trailose. We don't produce trailose, probably figure that out, um, because we don't survive. Don't try it, but if you dry yourself out completely, you will survive. Um, but they, these, these organisms produce this, and this trailose actually coats the membranes of the cells and stabilizes it when it dries out. It actually forms a glassy membrane. But when you add water, it dissolves, and the cells go back to normal. Um, now, you may not produce trailers, but you may have some trailers in your body, so you never know. Um, it's used a lot in food, especially in donuts. I don't know if you know why, but you know, if you have a donut that's kind of getting old, three, four months old, you don't want it to look three or four months old, you put some trailers in when you make it, it might look like it was just made yesterday, but it might be four months old. So uh, it, it's used as you know, preservative, and um, it's you know, safe to eat. Um, but we started to wonder, what if we could use trailers in red blood cells? It's, it seems to be safe. Definitely works well in these organisms. Maybe we can coat the, the cell membrane for red blood cells with trailers and keep it from um, 
you know, falling apart when we dry it out. Um, and this was research that actually I'm doing in collaboration with a uh, researcher at the Depart Department of Biology, Dr. Michael Menz. This is his ex area of expertise. He's been studying these, these organisms, especially the brine shrimps. He's been studying them for years and really knows a lot about this, which is good because I don't know a lot about this. I should point out this is actually the PhD student working on this, Press Janis, who um, was giving blood um, recently. He, also, he was actually wanted to learn more about um, the blood supply in the Red Cross, and he was having trouble getting them to talk to him, so he just gave blood and then had plenty of time to talk to him. But uh, he's been working on this as well, so I should give credit where credit is due because they, they are the ones that really understand this. But the problem with triolose is um, it doesn't cross a million membranes. So if we just take red blood cells and put it in a solution with triolose, that triolose doesn't get in too well. Uh, so they actually, that Brett, the grad student, was the one that really came up with this idea. He said, why can't we use your ultrasound research to get triolose inside the cells? Make little pores in the cell membrane, get it to go in, and then they'll close up. And that's, that's, so that's what we do. We use the same approach we're using for our DNA, but we do it with triolose. Um, because it needs to be on both sides. If you just have it on this side, the in internal membranes will fall apart. So that's what we're working on. Um, and this is the idea to basically do this. Um, we found, originally we were doing this with a bulk setup where we had a tank of, um, we basically just mix everything together in a test tube and apply ultrasound in the tank of water. But uh, we found it was kind of less consistent, not the ideal setup. So we've come up with an alternative method using microfluidics. This is an example of one of our microfluidic chips. So we flow our samples through this chip and we actually apply ultrasound while the sam samples are flying, flowing through. You can see the schematic here. We have an ultrasound transducer. We have the bubbles, the trailers, the cells flowing through. And then we sonoprate them here. And then they hopefully get loaded as they flow through. So it can be more consistent. You can see a video here of them. Uh, it's actually running already. Um, so these are the cells flowing through the channels. We have three channels here in this image. So that's what we've been working on. So that's where some of the engineering comes in. We've been using um, some of the resources here to build these. And this is actually an example of our prototype system that we've been using. Um, you'll see the blood's flowing through here. It's a little hard to see, but there's blood flowing through here. And then, you can see it on this one, but um, it's basically flowing inside. Inside here is our microfluidic device. We've got our ultrasound. There's, there's air going through it. We're producing the sample. So we've been using this for, for our studies. First thing we did was to see okay, how much trailers can we get into the, the uh, cells. Uh, we did different doses of bubbles. This was with our original bulk setup. This is with our microfluidics uh, prototype. And we saw high, even higher levels of trailers delivery when we did it with the microfluidics. And it seems to be uh, loading pretty well. And so the next thing we did is we took that and we dried it out. And this is actually what it looks like. It's kind of pink. For some reason, it's less red when it's dry. It's kind of interesting. But when you rehydrate it, it turns red again. Uh, but this, this, is a, this was actually a liter of blood in solution and then we, when we dried it out, it's a little bit less, about 200, like 200 milliliters. Um, but we dried it out, we, we had a, this was the first time we were able to dry this much, so we were pretty excited to it. Usually we were drying much smaller amounts. Um, but that's, that's what it looks like when it's dried out. And then we rehydrate it, and this is uh, what they look like. This is actually, uh, Brett, Janice took these pictures uh, on the SEM. And this is a picture of one of the red blood cells before we rehydrated it. So you can see the trailers actually on top there. We've got some clumps of trailers, but also just basically coating the cell. And then after you rehydrate it, they go back to looking like normal red blood cells, uh, what we've seen so far. And then um, we looked at, we also just looked at directly freezing them and thawing them. So not going through the whole process of drying them completely, but just freezing and thawing. We saw, we used a couple different buffers, and we saw that um, our recovery was pretty good. When we freeze and thaw, it's about 90% or more recovery. They, they look viable. Uh, when we did this uh, with um, the, for freeze drying, so we not only freeze, but also dry them and rehydrate them, then the recovery is a little bit lower. But with our, micro, so with the bulk technique, we're getting up to maybe 25% or so. And then with our microfluidic system, um, it looks like it's a little bit better, um, getting up to 40%. And the viability is a little lower, but there's a lot. Most of them seem to be viable. Um, so, so that's that's kind of where we are with this. Now, those results look really exciting and encouraging, but um, I will say there's a caveat as always. Um, those are with lower concentrations of blood of our blood cells. 
So we found that as we increase the concentration, our recovery drops significantly, and we are currently doing some experiments to work around that, and um, looks like we're making progress on that. But that's, uh, I don't want you to get the message that this is working perfectly and ready to go and save lives yet. We're working out towards that. Uh, but at the lab scale, we've got some encouraging results. And it's, every single time I run this experiment and I see the cells, you know, as a powder, I add water, and then I look at them on the microscope, and they're there. I'm just blown away. Like, how does that happen? I mean, I know it happens. It's, it's, the the trailus does its job, but it's just amazing. Um, but when we're trying to do, you know, clinically, we need to do a large amount, large concentrations of blood, and we're not there yet. That's the challenge. Uh, but we're hoping, you know, that we're on the right track. Um, we have ongoing collaborations with the U.S. military that we're, we're setting up, trying to set up here to do um, animal, large animal testing and, and hopefully clinical trials. Our target is within five years. It's ambitious, but, you know, it's possible. I didn't mention, they're actually using this uh, trailers already in clinical trials for platelets. They're actually drying platelets as a powder with trailers. Um, they're working on improving the process. Right now they have a different process that doesn't use ultrasound and probably could be improved. But either way, they've been able to make enough progress that they're, they're able to do clinical trials. A lot of interest in using this for the military, as you can imagine, right? Um, there are scenarios where there are people who are in locations where they don't have access to blood products for maybe a couple days. And if they could take a dry, dry blood, don't have to worry about keeping it cold, um, that would really help. The other area we've seen is EMS, especially uh, uh, air ambulances and helicopters are very interested in being able to take this on a helicopter because it's very hard for them to take refrigerated blood on helicopters. Um, they do it sometimes, but it's a challenge. And then also remote places. I was recently, uh, we went to uh, a number of different locations, including Alaska and Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico actually has a pretty good blood supply, but they did have problems when they had the hurricane that hit. Um, Alaska, uh, it's very, very interesting. They don't have roads in most parts of Alaska, so everything gets flown in by airplane. So they usually use, um, I mean, they just don't have a lot of blood. Um, they don't have platelets, they don't have many units of blood out there. They usually bring in a plane and fly people to Seattle if they really need a lot of blood. So um, we, we, when we went out there, there was a lot of interest in, in something like this. But ultimately, our hope is that this is successful, it will save lives, you know, here in this country, in different parts of this country, and, and around the world. So that's our goal there. So I want to acknowledge um, the people that have been involved. Uh, this is some of the people, some of the students, the bioengineering students that helped out with this project. Uh, we went to the clean room in the MNTC and fabricated some of the uh, microfluidic devices, and so they helped out with that. I got a picture over there. Um, this was uh, some of the people in my lab um, as well at a recent event. Uh, but obviously this doesn't happen without all the work that they did. And we've had some really great contributions from even undergrad students or grad students in our department. Um, so, you know, definitely the bioengineering department's been uh, very supportive and, and helpful for the research that we're doing. And then the funding, I will also acknowledge because this doesn't happen without money. Um, the, two, the two ways that research projects usually <coughs> stop or end is usually because of lack of funding or the people working on leave. Um, usually, I, I, at least I haven't seen research projects that run out of questions to ask. Um, there's always something you can study. But we've been fortunate, we've had funding from NIH, NASA, NSF, and American Heart Association. It's all uh, played a role in, in this research. And um, we've also had some really good collaborator, collaborators, both in Speed School and in other parts of campus, biology, cancer center, cardiology. Um, so. Um, again, this would happen without their support. So thanks for listening. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to.